I recently met a man who told me right off the bat during general dating conversation that he loved it when a woman cooked for him, gave him back rubs, and just generally did, st did stuff for him. I'm confused as to how to proceed after that because John says not to give too much, but to allow the man to give to you. Now, I'm sure that ideally both partners give to each other once you're in a relationship. But in the beginning, how should you proceed if you're dealing with a man who says this? Is he simply trying to use me? Is he a less masculine type male? What? <laughs> That's a great question, don't you think? <laughs> it's, it's a great question. It, it's one of my objections to uh Dr. Chapman, who I admire greatly, he's a wonderful human being, and he wrote the book, Five Love Languages. And he just doesn't, I, at least in his books, he doesn't talk about gender differences. I don't think he's against them. But in terms of the love languages, one of the love languages is someone who does things for me, right? Right. So you, you found a guy who read the book. He read the book, Love Languages. So I want you to know, I'm into the love language, do things for me. If a man ever says that to you, what you should say is, woman, that's great. I am too. I like it as well. That's the answer for it. Okay. There's nothing wrong with doing things for a guy as long as he's doing a little more for you. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> and and that, that's the problem with that book. And, you know, the book is like kind of same thing as Men Are From Mars. It's the revelation that people are different and we need to find out what they need most. Now you add to that gender, a lot of people think what they need most, actually a man who thinks he needs a, this neck rubs and a woman who cooks for him, you know, this is, uh, it, it, there's nothing wrong with that, but he says, that's my need and what's your need? And she says, well, I need it all. <laughs> I need affection, <laughs> gifts of love, reassurance, <laughs> you know, there's all of those things. Women need it all. And if they don't, that's a problem for them. And men need it all, but to not as to not as great extent. What men need is to feel successful in in what they do in providing that for her. That's the real need. But he's in touch with his female side. He likes neck rubs. He likes somebody to cook for him. And hey, that's not a problem if she likes to cook and maybe she likes to give neck rubs. That's not a problem. But it's a it's a tricky thing when when men think, okay, what I need is is action to serve me because that's basically what all female side needs the most is action to serve me think about the whole history of mankind the cooking thing however is a little different in that if you love to cook that's not a problem if you have if you're home and you're raising children you'd be cooking anyway so why not cook for him but when you don't have children around that you you naturally feel uh, an instinct when you're a mother and you have time and resources, you want to nourish them. Your breast feeds them. Cooking is actually a very nourishing thing, unless you've got issues with it. Uh, it, it. It can be very, very relaxing for women to do cooking because uh, nourishing others is very feminine. So it helps her produce female hormones through cooking. That can be, unless she doesn't want to, then it's not going to produce female hormones. But uh, when, when I married Bonnie, I said, actually, I never said, I, I want you to cook for me. She just said she was happy to cook for me. And I told her that anytime she wants me to cook for her, I will do that. I'll take you out to the restaurant. <laughs> I'll, I'll go and get takeout. Because I told her there's no requirement. You don't have to cook. But I have to say, I, I, part of my preference in picking Bonnie was that she loved to cook and she was a good cook. And that was wonderful. Her, her complaint to me is that, I didn't care that much about food because <laughs> I've been a monk. I, I, even now, I only eat one meal a day. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of transcendent when it comes to needing food. Unless my girlfriend's not here, unless my wife's not here because she passed on, I need the sweetness from a woman. And if I don't get it, then I will eat a little too much. Uh huh. Yeah, hence the cookie craving, right? <laughs> hence the cookie craving. Cookies right. produce, sweetness produces estrogen. And... Uh, but it's also anything that makes you feel dependent, it produces estrogen. And uh, when women are too far on their male side and they don't have relationship skills to produce their estrogen, then they all, often have addiction to food. Yeah, yeah. So the key here, again, just to kind of like put the exclamation point on what you said is it's not that it's inappropriate for a woman to give in a relationship and a healthy relationship has giving on both sides, but there needs to be that reciprocity 
And if I'm hearing you right, in the beginning stages, early stages of a relationship, the man doing a little more. Definitely. And you're never going to have exact. So err on the err on the side, women, of giving less and receiving more. It should always be, that's the direction you lean in. So we all want to be giving. Here's the dynamic. This is male, female. Actually, giving to get, giving to get is masculine. Giving in response to receiving is feminine. Ooh, okay, that's, so this, a, that's a gem right there. It's a gem right there. You know, men provide to get love. That's it. We do that to get, we all need love and we need money. So I go to work to get money. A woman goes to work to get money. She's producing testosterone. Nothing wrong with it. I'm giving to get, you know, I do counseling because people pay me. I don't do counseling if people don't pay me. You know, that's my job. So I give to get. What does a husband do? I give my wife everything because I want to get love. And if I don't get love, then that natural instinct starts to close down in men. Now, part of my thing is, you know, if it starts to close down, then you realize you're expecting too much. You need to give yourself what you need. Then you open your heart again. And then as a man, you go give to get. So you have to know all the formulas of how to actually get love from a woman. Men don't know what women really need. So they, <laughs> they feel no matter what I do, it doesn't make her happy. She doesn't love me. And I go, that's because what you're doing is completely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. <laughs> now for women, while, while women don't, you know, that, that's a part of women is their masculinity. They need the skills and the tools. But one of the mistakes women make is their tendency is they know how good it feels to give. It feels good to give, but it only feels good to give when you are have received so much. See, that's generous. Oh, I feel I have so much. I want to overflow. So you're giving back that actually that giving back is not a giving to get. When you give to get, you're making testosterone. When you give because you have so much to give or you're giving back because you receive so much. Primarily, the hormone that gets produced is a blend of progesterone and estrogen. And that is most important for women to produce in their body in that 12 days after their period. That's when they're making both progesterone and estrogen. Estrogen is I'm receiving. And then progesterone is I've received. So now I want to give back. But as soon as she goes into I haven't received. And so I'm now giving to get you to love me her body is making testosterone. And it's what's interesting, her body makes, every woman makes testosterone out of their progesterone. So she becomes progesterone deficient. And then she experiences something called estrogen dominance, which generally occurs between ovulation and her period, those 12 days, and she has PMS and, and dissatisfaction during that time. That's usually often she can feel very needy because she thinks I need more estrogen at a time when her body wants to receive and give more. So it's very important that during the period from her est from the end of her period to ovulation, that's when she needs to primarily receive more, receive more, receive more and not give so much at all. Just appreciate, ask for help, do things for herself, enjoy her life not so much feel pressure to give to anybody. Then after ovulation is where she will feel, oh, I've received so much, now I want to give. And so giving from receiving is going to produce both estrogen and progesterone, which is a blend that needs to dominate, needs to dominate. Still, she can you know, do that on the way up towards ovulation. But the primary thing for romance, for example, is doubling her estrogen, which is having a man do a lot of stuff for her, which is why you mentioned in the dating, primarily the man is doing stuff for her. Once she's receiving so much, she can start giving back. But that's that's her control to keep her to keep her from feeling resentful because resentment will be automatic. Just like if I punch somebody, they'll bruise. If you give more than you receive, you'll start bruising, and it takes time to heal a bruise. And you, the first step is you have to stop bruising yourself. <laughs> you have to stop overgiving, and now start giving to yourself not looking to somebody else to get love from them. But you can give love freely to children. That's because they always give you unconditional love so much you're giving back to them. 
that's why nurturing is very feminine, but actually it's, it's giving back. When you nurture a child, it's, they give you so much unconditional love. You just, it just pours out of you. Mm -hmm. And then after menopause, uh, women still, in order to maintain healthy estrogen levels, still need to be in that mode of receptivity and doing things to support their healthy estrogen levels. Because I yeah, know we yeah. have, we know, you know, we have a lot of women a little older here who are no yeah. longer cycling. Right. So the same, you won't, you don't have as much of the concrete biological uh strong cycling, but it's still happening on smaller levels, on smaller levels. Uh, you need to experience a balance in your life. Think about this. I need to have a balance in my life as I get older, a feeling I'm getting what I need. And then I'm also giving back what I'm getting. And it's so easy as you get older, when you don't have these hormones to at least help to control you, uh, you don't have that. But by that time, ideally, you would have learned how to receive. So now when you're giving to others, you're giving from a place that I've learned how to receive. So I'm receiving and giving. So your hormones aren't so much controlling you, but you're controlling their production more. Naturally, your hormones will control you at a younger age if you're in harmony with them. But right now, unfortunately, our, uh, our culture is just telling women, you know, you're inadequate if you're not achieving and accomplishing and what's wrong with you. And if you're feminine, you're weak and needy and you shouldn't depend on anybody for anything. You can do it yourself. Otherwise, you're not lovable. That's the message the culture's saying. It's telling all men that you're not good enough. You know, Bill Gates has got all the money and what happened to you? You know, he was just a kid. Why did he, you know, it's always this, uh, that culture is always saying you need more. You're not good enough. You should have more and you don't have it. So what's wrong with you? We all feel this message of dissatisfaction that we're being conditioned to feel. It's not who we are. We are, we are abundant. We are lovable. We have just everything we need. If we look around, it's there. We're just not looking at it because we're just rejecting what we have. Not, not enough, not enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think I know we've talked about this um, receiving these this receptivity, John, before. And I think that one thing I think women often miss is how satisfying it can be for a man to be able to provide something, to be able to give something, to add something to a woman's life and have her receive. And I like to call it graciously receiving because she's receiving, but she's also acknowledging and appreciating him for that. So he gets that positive reinforcement, which I believe helps him to feel that masculine kind of energy that helps create and foster attraction. Absolutely. Everything you said is completely accurate. And I'll give you another example of graciously receiving. I like that phrase is, uh, you know, Bonnie drives different from me. And so when I see a yellow light, I run through it, I speed up. And when she sees a yellow light, she stops. <laughs> that's just who she is. That's her comfort zone. And my comfort zone is speeding up. So when I'm in the car with her and there's a yellow light, I stop. And I put my hand on her thigh and I say, honey, I did that for you. Oh. And she says, I know. She says, I know. And I appreciate it. So you see what she's saying in that I know and I appreciate it is I know that that's not your comfort zone. And you're doing that as a gift to me. And I really appreciate that. That makes me feel special. As opposed to a woman who's not aware of these different needs and ways of interacting, she might go, well, you shouldn't run through a yellow light. My way is the right way. That's how you should drive. <laughs> or she go, here's another example. I call this taking your partner for granted. And women do this and men do it in other ways. But women do it from the point of view of, of uh, feeling, well, I give you so much you should give me. Instead of like, regardless of how much I give you, what you do for me is a truly gift that you care and you want to share that. This isn't a business deal. This is you care about me. So what I do isn't the reason why you give to me. The reason you give to me is because you care about me. You respect me. You love me. You want to please me. Not because I've done things for you, but because that's the place you want to come to. That's called not taking your partner for granted. And that's what people have so much passion in the beginning of relationships. One of the reasons from one perspective is because we have no 
require, we don't have any of that taking each other for granted. Like, well, you should take me out on a date. You know, I made you dinner last night. Uh, <laughs> you, should, you should buy me flowers. I do your laundry, you know, <laughs> and just the, all that should stuff that comes from scorekeeping. And yet at the same time, biologically, we do keep score. When a man does a lot of little things for a woman, showing consideration, caring, listening, uh, uh, giving hugs, uh, giving her help in different ways, being a good listener, all these things I just mentioned, men don't know are so important because they don't make money. And, but they actually make estrogen. So you can give her the 50 roses, you'll get the same surge of estrogen as you would get with one rose. If she has low estrogen, you can give 50 roses and it doesn't do anything. You can give one rose, it doesn't do anything. Each has does about the same amount. But if a woman has normal estrogen levels, you give her 50 roses, there's going to be a nice surge of estrogen. One rose will do the trick as well. So do lots of little things. Now men start to get a reason why, you know, things are not so great in the relationship is because he thinks one big thing should, you know, be a thousand points. And really every act of love, big or small, is one point, one surge of estrogen. Yeah, and I think it kind of goes along with the idea of, a woman who says, well, I need my husband to tell me I, that he loves me every single day. And the man's going, well, I told her I loved her. Nothing has changed, right? It kind of right. goes along right. with that. Well, that, that's how the man takes her for granted. He okay. thinks, well, I did that already. Well, I did that already. Why do I have to do it again? I'm doing the big stuff. And he doesn't understand little stuff is very, very important. And one of the primary emotional needs of women, meaning a need for that produces estrogen is reassurance that she's special, you know, and I need reassurance that I'm successful. It's just a different reassurance. You know, I'm, in, I'm invested in the stock market right now. I look every day to see how my stocks are doing. I'm not going to sell them. I'm in really good stocks that I'm in. And, but I still want to go, did I, did I lose anything? Did I make anything? I'm <laughs> looking for reassurance. Says, wow, what a great investor I am. You know, when I, when my books were all on the bestseller list, I'd look every Sunday. I wanted to see, I'm still number one. I'm still number one. Didn't that feel good? That's me looking for reassurance that I'm a success. Everybody, if you're for your masculine side, wants to feel acknowledged for your success, your competence, your capability. And your feminine side wants to be acknowledged as I'm important and I'm special. I'm lovable and I'm worthy and all those good things. I'm a good person. And you see that and you want to love that. And you want to, and I need help. I need support. And you're there for me. See, I had a, a woman write to me today on one of the shows I did, my Facebook show, and her question was, uh, oh, what was her question? Now I forgot it. Anyway, we'll, keep, we'll stay on subject here. We got your questions. We'll stick with that. Okay. So this one I wanted to bring up because I wanted to bring to the attention of this audience um, a question that was written in about your book, Mars, Venus on a Date, which, by the way, John, I recommend to my coaching clients. And one of my coaching clients, we were having a um, conversation the other day, and she said, oh, she said, these five stages that John talks about, these stages of dating that John talks about in this book, she said, this gave me so much, this has given me so much clarity. So, so here's a related question from Monica. She says, hi, John, thanks for taking our questions. In your book, Mars, Venus on a Date, you talk about the stages of dating. And I'm wondering if this is something to discuss with someone I am dating. If that's the first question, if a man consciously chooses to move through the stages of uh, through the stages with a woman or if it is something that just naturally happens. You know, everybody's a little bit different. You know, it'd be like, you know, some guys are like, hey, let's read this book together and and check this out. And, and you know, it's different temperaments like that structure. Uh, in most cases, it's just going to be if a woman reads the book, she's aware of the pitfalls of every stage and how to make sure it's happening and to kind of know where she is as the relationship is unfolding. I think that the more heartfelt we are, the more mature we are, and you can move to those stages very, very quickly because you have a, you already have a sense of who you are. You know, for me, I'll give an example. After 34 years of marriage with Bonnie, uh, you know, I know who I am and I know all my buttons that can be pushed. I know how to let them all go. 
So for me to start a new relationship, you know, I gave myself a year to grieve and I said, okay, now I'll start a relationship and boom, I found the person. And I don't, I don't have all those doubts and questions because I know who I am. I know what I want. I know just what I want. And I found it right away. I mean, it's just like my friends say, how are you doing? I said, oh, I'm having a great life. And how do you find that? Yes. Well, I'm a relationship expert. You know, I should, <laughs> yeah. if you, if you know who you are, you know, uh, yeah, and, and you, you see what happens when our buttons get pushed, we get upset and then we become judgmental or critical or doubtful of others. When you know who you are, you find the right person right away because they will mirror who you are and you love who you are. So you will love them. But that's, you know, I'm, I've been doing this 50 years, almost 70 years old and personal growth is my thing. So it's very easy for me now to do all this stuff only because I've been doing it for so long. So having said that, having said that, uh, what is my, what is the, the question here? Remind me of the question. The is question when, is, are the stages of dating, is it something to discuss? Oh, is it something natural? Okay. Yeah. Love at first sight, for example, you know, you might be right when you have love at first sight and, and that can happen. That's just feeling strong attraction or it's a real soul knowing. Uh, it's not that common, but it can happen. Uh, you know, my kids, Bonnie, I think in our last year that we were talking a lot about our relationship to the kids and, and one of my daughters said to Bonnie, did you know that dad was the one when you first right away? And Bonnie said, the first time I saw him, I know he was the one. Really? And, and then they said to me, dad, did you feel that? I said, I said, she's the one I want to have sex with tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's an honest response. <laughs> yes. Actually, I didn't say sex with the kids. I said, she's the one, I, she's the person that I want to spend the night with. <laughs> so that's what I knew. But ironically, even though we had such a beautiful connection right away, we ended up breaking up. And it wasn't until I got married to somebody else, learned a lot of lessons, made a lot of mistakes, did some healing. And then came back knowing she was the one. So, and she she was the one. She still is the one in my heart. So there's this thing we have to recognize that I can share from my own experience is you could be with your soulmate and not know you're with your soulmate because you're not ready for them. You haven't grown enough to recognize the one. You don't love yourself enough to, to actually stay with somebody who truly loves you, who's right for you. Because, you know, not all of our thinking is correct and we're down on ourselves, hard on ourselves, doubting ourselves. So back to the question. I'm just trying to answer questions today. So the, the question is, so do you go through those stages? Mainly you go through them being aware of where you are in the whole thing without trying to explain to where your partner is in the whole thing. But the third stage, first is attraction, then comes doubting, then comes commitment, then comes deeper intimacy. Your stuff comes up and you're able to overcome it. Then comes proposal. And then you act as if you're married, but without all the pressures of being married, then you get married. So that's them in short. And every stage has its own challenges. So the one I'll talk about right now that you do need to you know, clearly talk about. The others, you just need to understand and act appropriately rather than make the common mistakes people make. But when it gets the commitment, that's where you need to discuss that I'm not willing uh, to be physically intimate with you until we get to know each other enough to where I know that you're committed to me and you're not going to be having sex with other people if I'm having sex with you. Because you should, in my opinion, it's extremely confusing for a woman mm -hmm. and not confusing for a man, but subconsciously confusing for him. He doesn't know when he's confused or not, but <laughs> he'll, he'll just feel like, I don't know if I want to be with her, you know, <laughs> and then uh, I don't know what went wrong, you know, what I'm ready to move on. He doesn't, He's just sort of lost in, in the whole thing. Women will often feel confused. You know, they feel like, I, I don't know. Is he right? Is he wrong? Is he wrong? Does he love me? Does he? That's when you want to all talk about the relationship. But there's a place where he wants to have sex with you. And you go, you know, I want to have sex with you. But I know for me, you're talking, I'm being the woman here. For me, it just doesn't work for me to have sex if I if, if the man I'm having sex with is having sex with anybody else. So I want to feel that as long as we're having sex together, that we have a, a commitment and a promise to each other, then we're not going to have sex with, the, with other people. And in the beginning, I still need to go really slow with it. I don't want to have a whole lot of sex. I mean, I want to, but I know that I, I need to have it just occasionally, maybe like once a week where it generally works for me. And 
But I also need to feel that you're not having sex with anybody else in between or that you're not having sex with yourself. Uh, that's really what works for me. I like to feel that the energy is building up. Now, that's pretty bold to say. He may not agree to that, but that's you really want a relationship. That's why I tell women, find a guy who wants you more than you want him, and he'll be willing to play by your rules. Uh, but if you're trying to please a guy, you're going to be afraid to even say something like that. And it really is kind of weird today to say something like that. I'll grant it, but I'm trying to popularize this research that shows that if men have sex, if men ejaculate more than once a week, they lose interest in the woman they're having sex with and are more interested in other women. And that's what causes us to become so confused is we, you know, we start to compare. As soon as a man's testosterone levels go down, a woman's estrogen levels go down, that means she's in a little stress state. Whenever we're in stress, we always start comparing and comparing is the thief of our happiness. There's always better on the other side of the fence, you know, if you're feeling stressed. If you're not feeling stressed and you understand that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence is actually what you become when you're stressed, then you don't pay much attention to that and you focus on the good that you have. But that takes maturity. And that's why there's stages of this whole thing, because you, before you even get to that level, you have to have deep intimacy where you know yourself and you're able to share yourself with your partner. So that's where your stage four is where your partner triggers you and you have all these uh, you know, judgments or disapproval or arguments that come up and you're able to di dissipate them very quickly by taking responsibility for going deeper and recognizing how you contribute to problems rather than them being the problem. You are responsible for how you feel. And that's the deep intimacy that you start to experience. You overcome that. Now you wake up one morning and you go, he's the one for me. Because you've connected with your soul through the relationship. Then you can see if they're your soulmate or not. And sometimes you get to that level of intimacy and they're not the one for you. You love them, but you realize they're not right for you. And that's okay too. How do you know if somebody's right, really right for you as a soulmate? Your heart has to be fully open. So how do you know if somebody's not right for you? Your heart has to be fully open because when your heart's open, it's not like they opened your heart. You opened your heart in relationship to them and were able to know if they're the one that you want to share your life with. They could be the one you want to grow in love with for a while and move on. It, there's, no, there's no just because you love someone, you have to spend your life with them or they're the right person for you. But if you open your heart, then you know. Knowing is something that comes to us when our heart is open. And it's just no reasons even. There may be reasons that help you open your heart, but knowing is a knowing. Like if I have a cold glass of water, a refreshing glass of water, I know it's cold. It's just a knowing. Well, we all have that capacity when our heart is open. But in our relationships, when you use negativity to get what you want, you're not connected to your soul. The soul uses love to get what you want. And when you use negativity, basically you're lying because you're not negative. You're a positive being. And it's a, it's a partial truth. It's what you feel, but it's not the complete truth. You know, you can be angry with somebody. Oh, I'm angry about you. But now I realize that, you know, you didn't mean to say that or you really do care. So I'll let it go. So I care about you. So now you, you've, you've gotten to the complete truth, which is, yes, I was angry, but now it's an incomplete belief or feeling. It needs to get back to love. And then it's forgiveness. And that's the, that's the total truth. We want to learn how to get to the real truth of life. And that's by getting to the truth of who we are, which is we're loving human beings, but we do interdepend on each other. We're dependent. We need love. We need support. We need to be loving. Otherwise, we're not being our true self. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was beautifully said. And, you know, coming back just for a second to the five stages in your book, which, by the way, everyone, I really highly recommend um, the stages in your book. When I thought back on this, when my husband and I were dating, and one of the distinctions, because I didn't get married till I was 43, so I dated a lot of different people, and I, I didn't have the easiest time finding what felt like the right relationship for me, which is part of the reason I do the work that I do, because I'm really passionate about how good that can be when you find the right person, um, and how hard it can feel when you don't have the right person. And yeah. so... Um, but one of the things I noticed was that with my husband and I, we never discussed, you know, the stages of dating or anything like that. But things just felt like they naturally, gracefully progressed in a way where it didn't feel like there was struggle. It didn't feel like there was drama. 
And it just felt like the relationship just like naturally, it wasn't push me, pull me, one person way into it more than the other, naturally and gracefully evolved. And yet, when I look in the book, I can see, you know, I can see how, yep, that's what was happening then, that's what's happening then. We were naturally and gracefully moving through those stages. And I do think your uh, your wisdom about some of the pitfalls to watch out for, since a lot of the women are out there dating, is so incredibly valuable. Yeah, so you answered the question better than me, but it, having heard what you just said, it, it, the answer is, I, I came up with those five stages because you can see that people who get married, have good relationships, all went through them. And I can see at the it's a natural unfoldment of the stages of a plant developing, for example. It goes through stages. And it's not like you're saying, okay, now we're going to we're going to force this stage and we're going to force this stage. It's a natural unfoldment of typically what happens when people bond and the bonding grows. At the same time, what I did is said, be aware of what stage you're in. Then you know what your challenges are. You also know what your pitfalls are so that you don't fall into them. Because like in the stage of commitment, often one of the pitfalls there is men have a tendency to say, okay, now that we're having sex, I don't have to work so hard <laughs> to make you love me. And so they, they tend to become a bit more passive and a woman will tend to feel like, oh, he's becoming passive. I should work harder. You know, now that we're in a committed relationship, I'll give more in the relationship. And by giving more, he ends up going further the other direction. So that would be a pitfall in that situation that you wanna look out for. And, and so many people naturally move through them and they're able to overcome those pitfalls and people that don't end up happily married or if that's their goal, they don't, uh, they don't make it because they hit one of those pitfalls and did made a mistake. And so here's how you can correctly evaluate what's going on at, from, some of the, from a wisdom point of view rather than falling into the pitfalls. So I point those out. Yeah, yeah, it's really a wonderful book. And I, I also am just learning um, more and more about some of the things you're teaching in um, Beyond Mars Venus. And a lot of the hormonal things are making a lot more sense to me going deeper with some of this too. So we recommend John's books. And John, I want to be respectful of your time because I know you have another interview today. But I do want to give you a chance to leave us the last word here. Keep in mind that Many singles are wishing to be in a relationship and many people who are married are wishing to be single again. <laughs> so <laughs> our, our, our suffering is really something that we create inside ourselves. And as we gain more wisdom and knowledge, we begin to realize we can, we can find the love that we deserve and you will get it. Particularly, you know, as you're reaching out today, I know you continue to reach out for new knowledge to recognize how you contribute to the problems in the past in your relationships. And each time you come back to love, you become clearer in your ability to attract the right person for you, to know who's the right person for you and have the skills to keep them the right person for you, if that's possible. So it's a real, real pleasure to spend time with you and to do these interviews. Oh, thank you so much, John. And thank you so much for your generosity and for being willing to field all of these questions. And you're so generous with your wisdom. And I really love what you've shared because I know that your work is making such an impact in the world. And for this audience, we're really honored and we want to express our gratitude and appreciation for your generosity. It really means a lot. You're very, very welcome. Thank you so much. Bye-bye for now. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.